Chapter 10 Throwing the Hammer The nice thing about Matilda was that if you ever met her casually and talked to her, you would have thought she was a perfectly normal five-and-a-half-year-old child. She displayed almost no outward signs of her brilliance, and she never showed off. This is a very sensible and quiet little girl, you would have said to yourself. And unless for some reason you started a discussion with her about literature or mathematics, you would never have known the extent of her brain power. It was therefore easy for Matilda to make friends with other children. All those in her class liked her. They knew, of course, that she was clever because they'd heard her being questioned by Miss Honey on the first day of term. And they knew that she was always allowed to sit quietly with a book during lessons and not pay attention to the teacher. But the children of their age did not search deeply for reasons. They're far too wrapped up in their own small struggles to worry over much about what others are doing and why. Among Matilda's newfound friends was the girl called Lavender. Right from the first day of term, the two of them had started wandering around together during the morning break and in the lunch hour. Lavender was exceptionally small for her age, a skinny little nymph with deep brown eyes and dark hair that was cut in a fringe across her forehead. Matilda liked her because she was gutsy and adventurous. She liked Matilda for exactly the same reason. Before the first week of term was up, awesome tales about the headmistress, Miss Trunchbull, began to filter through to the newcomers. Matilda and Lavender, standing in a corner of the playground during morning break on the third day, were approached by a rugged ten-year-old with a boil on her nose called Hortensia. New scum, I suppose, Hortensia said to them, looking down at them from her great height. She was eating an extra-large bag of potato crisps and digging the stuff out in handfuls. Welcome to Borstal, she added, spraying bits of crisps out of her mouth like snowflakes. The two tiny ones, confronted by this giant, kept a watchful silence. Have you met the Trunchbull yet? Hortensia asked. We've seen her at prayers, but we haven't met her. You've got a treat coming, Hortensia said. She hates very small children. She therefore loathes the bottom class and everyone in it. She thinks five-year-olds are grubs that haven't hatched out. In went another fistful of crisps, and when she spoke again, out sprayed the crumbs. If you survive your first year, you may just manage to live through the rest of your time here. But many don't survive. They get carried out on stretchers, screaming. I've seen it often. Hortensia paused to observe the effect these remarks were having on the two titchy ones. Not very much. They seemed pretty cool. So the large one decided to regale them with further information. I suppose you know that the Trunchbull has a lock-up cupboard in her private quarters called the Chokey. Have you heard about the Chokey? Matilda and Lavender shook their heads and continued to gaze up at the giant. Being very small, they were inclined to mistrust any creature that was larger than they, especially senior girls. The Chokey, Hortensia went on, is a very tall but very narrow cupboard. The floor is only 10 inches square, so you can't sit down or squat. You have to stand. And three of the walls are made of cement with bits of broken glass sticking out all over, so you can't lean against them. You have to stand more or less to attention all the time when you get locked in there. It's terrible. Can't you lean on the door? Matilda said. Don't be daft, Hortensia said. The door's got thousands of sharp, spiky nails sticking out. They've been hammered right through from the outside, probably by the Trunchbull herself. Have you ever been in there? Lavender asked. My first term, I was in there six times, Hortensia said. Twice for a whole day and the other times for two hours each. But two hours is quite bad enough. It's pitch dark and you have to stand up dead straight. And if you wobble at all, you get spiked either by the glass in the walls or the nails in the door. Why were you put in? Matilda asked. What had you done? The first time, Hortensia said, I poured half a tin of golden syrup onto the chair that the Trunchbull was going to sit on at prayers. It was wonderful. She lowered herself into the chair 
Then there was a loud squelching noise, similar to that made by a hippopotamus when lowering its foot into the mud on the banks of the Limpopo River. But you're small and stupid. You haven't read the Just So stories, have you? I've read them, Matilda said. You're a liar, Hortensia said. You can't even read yet, but no matter. So when the trunchbull sat down on the golden syrup, the squelch was beautiful. And when she jumped up again, the chair sort of stuck to the seat of those awful green breeches she wears and came up with her for a few seconds until the thick syrup slowly came unstuck. And she clasped her hands to the seat of her breeches and both her hands got covered in the muck. You should have heard her bellow. But how did she know it was you? Lavender asked. A little squirt called Ollie Bogwhistle sneaked on me, Hortensia said. I knocked his front teeth out. And the trunchbull put you in the chokey for all the day? Matilda asked, gulping. All day long, Hortensia said. I was off my rocker when she let me out. I was babbling like an idiot. What were the other things that you did to put you in the chokey? Lavender said. Oh, I can't remember all of them now, Hortensia said. She spoke with the air of an old warrior who'd been in so many battles that bravery had just become commonplace. It's all so long ago, she added, stuffing more crisps into her mouth. Ah, oh, yes, I can remember one. Here's what happened. I chose a time when I knew the trunchbull was out of the way, teaching the sixth formers, and I put my hand up and asked to go to the bogs. But instead of going there, I sneaked into the trunchbull's room. And after a speedy search, I found the drawer where she kept her gym knickers. Go on, Matilda said, spellbound. What happened next? I had sent away by post, you see, for this very powerful itching powder. Hortensia said, it costs 50 pence a packet and it's called the skin scorcher. The label said it was made from the powdered teeth of deadly snakes and it was guaranteed to raise welts the size of walnuts on your skin. So I sprinkled this stuff into every pair of knickers in the drawer, and then folded them all again up carefully. Hortensia paused, crammed some more crisps into her mouth. Did it work? Lavend asked. Well, Hortensia said, a few days later during prayers, the trunchbull suddenly started scratching herself like mad. Aha! I said to myself, here we go. She's changed for Jim already. It was pretty wonderful to be sitting there watching it all and knowing that I was the only person in school who knew exactly what was going on inside the trunchbull's pants. And I felt safe too. I knew I couldn't be caught. Then the scratching got worse. She couldn't stop. She must have thought she had a wasp's nest around there. And then right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, she leapt up, grabbed her bottom and ran out of the room. Both Matilda and Lavender were enthralled. It was quite clear to them that at this moment they were standing in the presence of a master. Here was somebody who had brought the art of skullduggery to the point of perfection. Somebody, moreover, who was willing to risk life and limb in pursuit of her calling. They gazed in wonder at this goddess, and suddenly even the boil on her nose were no longer a blemish but a badge of courage. But how did she catch you all that time? Lavender asked, breathless with wonder. She didn't, Hortensia said, but I got a day in the chokey just the same. Why? They both said. The trunchbull has a nasty habit of guessing. When she doesn't know who the culprit is, she makes a guess, and the trouble is she's often right. I was the prime suspect this time because of the golden syrup job. And although I knew she didn't have any proof, nothing I said would make any difference. I kept shouting, how could I have done it, Mr. Trunchbull? I didn't even know where you kept spare knickers. I didn't even know you kept any spare knickers at school. I don't even know what itching powder is. I've never heard of it. But the line didn't help me, despite the great performance I put on. The trunchbull simply grabbed me by one ear and rushed me to the chokey at the double and threw me inside and locked the door. It was my second all-day stretch. It was absolute torture. I was spiked and cut all over when I came out. It's like a war, Matilda said overall. 
You're darn right it's like a war, Hortensia cried, and the casualties are terrific. We are the Crusaders, the gallant army fighting for our lives with hardly any weapons at all. And the Trunchbull is the Prince of Darkness, the foul serpent, the fiery dragon with all the weapons at her command. It's a tough life. We all try to support each other. You can rely on us, Lavender said, making her height of three feet and two inches stretch as tall as possible. No, I can't, Hortensia said. You're only shrimps. But you never know. We might find a use for you one day in some undercover job. Tell us just a little bit more about what she does, Matilda said. Please do. I mustn't frighten you before you've been here a week, Hortensia said. You won't, Lavender said. We may be small, but we're quite tough. Listen to this then, Hortensia said. Only yesterday, the Trunchbull called a boy called Julius Rotwinkle eating licorice all sorts during the scripture lesson. And she simply picked him up by one arm and flung him clear out of the open classroom window. Our classroom is one floor up and we saw Julius Rotwinkle go sailing over the garden like a frisbee and landed with a thump in the middle of the lettuces. And then the Trunchbulls turned to us all and said, from now on, anybody caught eating in class will go straight out of the window. Did this Julius Rotwinkle break any bones, Lavender said. Only a few, Hortensia said. You've got to remember that the Trunchbull once threw the hammer for Britain in the Olympics, so she's very proud of her right arm. What's throwing the hammer? Lavender asked. The hammer, Hortensia said, is actually a ruddy great cannonball on the end of a long bit of wire, and the thrower whisks it round and round the head, faster and faster, and then lets go. You have to be terrifically strong. The Trunchbull will throw anything around just to keep our arm in, especially children. Good heavens, Lavender said. I once heard her say, Hortensia went on, that a large boy is about the same weight as an Olympic hammer, and he's therefore very useful for practising with. At that point, something strange happened. The playground, which up to then had been filled with shrieks and the shouting of children at play, all at once became silent as the grave. Watch out, Hortensia whispered. Matilda and Lavender glanced round and saw the gigantic figure of Miss Trunchbull advancing through the crowd of boys and girls with menacing strides. The children drew back hastily to let her through, and her progress across the asphalt was like that of Moses going through the Red Sea when the waters parted. A formidable figure she was too in her belted smock and green breeches. Below the knees, she had calf muscles that stood out like grapefruits inside her stockings. Amanda Thrip, she was shouting. You, Amanda Thrip, come here. Hold your hats, Hortensia whispered. What's going to happen? Lavender whispered back. That idiot Amanda, Hortensia said, has let her grow long hair grow even longer during the holes, and her mother has plaited it into pigtails. Silly thing to do. Why silly, Matilda asked. If there's one thing the Trunchbull can't stand, it's pigtails. Matilda and Lavender saw the giant in green breeches advancing on a girl of about ten who had a pair of plaited golden pigtails hanging over her shoulders. Each pigtail had a satin blue bow at the end of it, and it all looked very pretty. The girl wearing the pigtails, Amanda Thrip, stood quite still watching the advancing giant and the expression on her face was one that you might find on the face of someone who was tr for certain that the day of judgment had come for her at last. Miss Trenchbull now reached the victim and stood towering over her. I want those pigtails off before you come back to school tomorrow, she barked. Chop them off and throw them into the dustbin, you understand? Amanda, paralysed with fright, managed to stutter. But my mummy likes them. She pl she plaits them for me every morning. Your mummy is a twit, the Trunchbull bellowed. She pointed a finger the size of a salami at the child's head and shouted, You look like a rat with a tail coming out of its head. My, my mummy thinks I look lovely, Miss Tr Trunchbull. Amanda started shaking like a blancmange. I don't give a tinker's toot what your mummy thinks, the Trunchbull yelled. And with that, she lunged forward and grabbed hold of Amanda's pigtails with her right fist and lifted the girl clear off the ground. 
Then she started swinging her round, her head faster and faster, and Amanda was screaming blue murder, and the trunchbull was yelling, I'll give you pig dolls, you little rat. Shades of the Olympics, Hortensia said. She's getting up to speed now, like she does with a hammer. Ten to one, she's going to throw her. And now the trunchbull was leaning back against the weight of the whirling girl and pivoting expertly on her toes, spinning round and round. And soon Amanda Thripp was travelling so fast she became a blur. And suddenly, with a mighty grunt, the trunchbull let go of the pigtails and Amanda went sailing like a rocket right over the wire fence of the playground and high up into the sky. Well thrown, sir, someone shouted from across the playground, and Matilda, who was mesmerised during the whole crazy affair, saw Amanda Thripp descending on a long, graceful parabola onto the playing field beyond. She landed on the grass and bounced three times and finally came to rest. Then, amazingly, she sat up. She looked a trifle dazed, and who could blame her? But after a minute or so, she was on her feet again and tottering back to the playground. The trunchbull stood in the playground, dusting her hands. Not bad, she said, considering I'm not in strict training. Not bad at all. And she strayed away. She's mad, Hortensia said. But don't the parents complain, Matilda asked. Would yours? Hortensia asked. I know mine wouldn't. She treats mothers and fathers just the same as the children. They're all scared to death of her. I'll be seeing you sometime, you two. And with that, she sauntered away.